Hey, y'all. So we're in Isaiah chapter 40. <clears throat> and um, so we finished um, the 35 chapters with the four chapter kind of pause that he did. And so we're, we're in 40. <clears throat> so things get interesting. All right. So verse one, uh, God's people are comforted. That's the, the head for this, the headlining. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, <clears throat> says your God. So just a note on that. So all throughout scripture, we know that the comforter has been referred to as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> um, so all three are our comforters. Verse 2, speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand a double portion for all her sins. So <clears throat> a double portion, it's saying that Israel got a double portion for all her sins. Uh, a couple concepts behind that could be that um, Israel is God's firstborn. And the firstborn always gets or entitled to a double portion. And that is in a good sense or a bad sense. So um, could be just a figure of speech. Um, the Hebrew just suggests that um, it means that uh, it's paid in full. Their sins are paid, are paid in full. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, so we are talking about uh, in these coming um, scriptures here, we're talking about the day of reconciliation. So uh, God's forgiveness. All right, so from this point on, um, Isaiah starts really zeroing in on Messiah, the coming Messiah. So things start to get interesting here. All right, verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So that probably sounds familiar because John the Baptist said that. All right, so... <clears throat> That's what it reminds us of. Um, he quotes this scripture in particularly. Um, when he was asked, they asked him, the people asked him, are you Elijah? Are you Jeremiah? And he said no. And he quotes the scripture. So um, in Matthew 3.3, 3, you'll find that too. But John 1.23 is the other reference. So basically he's telling them that he is the voice that's making a way for the coming of the Lord. So... Um, the people thought that he was an Elijah, <clears throat> but he clearly told, he quotes this verse in Isaiah and tells them he's not. All right. Verse four, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. <clears throat> Five, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken the voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all its, and all its loveliness is like a flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. <clears throat> so basically here, what he's doing, he's just uh, putting our lives in perspective uh, really. So, um, if you've been in revelation, you know that, um, a lot of grass gets burned up <laughs> in the end by the Lord. Okay. So, um, James refers to our life, um, like a vapor that appears sort of season. So we're here just for a minute. We're here just for like a vapor, uh, you know, just disappear. So for a season. All right, so <clears throat> just a note here. So when God told me to start this study, this Bible study, he told me to start in Isaiah. And he made it very clear to me that I was supposed to start in Isaiah. So um, I think that was for a number of reasons. Uh, one being that America's fall is going to be equal in comparison to Jerusalem's fall. So, and also because there are over 500 direct quotes 
from the Old Testament and the book of Revelation. And I think that's why he told me to start here. So this reference, this quote that we just seen that John the Baptist um, quoted uh, in John and Matthew. So that is, that's just the beginning. <laughs> so I think that's why he had me start in the Old Testament. Um, because if you go through the book of Revelation, which this is an end time study, but if you go through the book of Revelation and you haven't done your homework in the Old Testament, it's going to confuse you. <clears throat> so I'm pretty sure, just a side note there, that um, that's probably just one of the reasons why he had me start in the book of Isaiah. Okay, back to it. <clears throat> um, verse 9. O Zion, you will bring good tidings. Get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem. You will bring good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. So what are good tidings? Good tidings is the gospel. So um, basically knowing good tidings and spreading the word, knowing uh, what God has saved us from. <clears throat> so the gospel's message is good because it gives in detail what we have been delivered from something that we could not, our debt could not be paid ourselves. So that is the good tidings of the gospel. All right. Verse 10, behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. What is his work? <clears throat> All right, his work, is, this is talking about the day of the Lord, tribulation, um, the, um, the time of Jacob's trouble, that's what that's talking about there. Verse 11, he will feed his flock like a shepherd, he will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in measure, weighed the mountains and scales in the hills in, in a balance? So God has weighed the earth, and this, I mean, the mathematics of it all gets pretty deep. So um, he's measured the earth because he formed it. He made it. So <clears throat> just some... Uh, little knowledge here, some little nuggets I have. So they say that if there is like a 1% change in the ozone layer, that it would bring like cosmic doom to the earth. So if you think about that and you turn the coin over, if there's a 1% change and it's that fine tuned, the earth and um, its inhabitants and everything that makes it work, and lets us be here without cosmic doom, then who fine-tuned it in the first place? We know God did, but it baffles me that there's scientists that <clears throat> they are today coming, they are they have come to the um, agreement that they think that there is a designer and there's somebody um, who runs this whole show, okay? But um, I just think it's funny that it takes all that time for people to realize that God is in charge. <laughs> he measured it all. It says right there, he formed everything. So, um, all right. So also NASA has been able to measure the universe and that blows my mind. I don't even know how they're able to do that, but they have. And, um, they know now that it is finite and not infinite. They always thought before that it was infinite, but it's not. Um, so it had a beginning. And if it had a beginning, then someone had to begin it. And we know who that person, that someone is, okay? Um, we've known all along. So ecologists should be firm believers at this point um, that it was all designed by the great designer. Um, this kind of stuff can't happen randomly. It's not possible. So uh, there is something called the Anthropic Principle. And the Anthropic Principle basically is when mathematicians tried to build a model of the universe and they got all these perimeters and stuff. So they find out how fine-tuned and delicate 
um, these numbers are and when they start trying to put things together and if they screw them up at all then I mean it would be mean you know cosmic doom for us but in this model so <clears throat> nothing living basically could survive here nothing so they search these perimeters out they can't even change one perimeter to like 10 to the fifth which is a huge number um, before it throws everything off so these these people, these ecologists, these mathematicians that are always trying to build these models and stuff should be firm believers that in God, they should be the first ones standing up and um, giving testimony for him. So not to say, not to say that some of them don't, but so it's just, I think it's funny that science consistently tries to prove God wrong. They always do. And it's just hilarious to me that they always prove him right <laughs> over and over again, all this time. They keep coming up with these conjectures and they're like, well, Hey, we discovered this. Well, yeah, it's in the Bible. We've known this all along. So they continue to prove him right. So they could have saved themselves a lot of time and just studied what the Bible had in it. <clears throat> so, um, something else interesting is there's an Orthodox Jew. Uh, his name's Gerald Schroeder, Dr. Gerald Schroeder. He's a nuclear physicist, and um, he wrote Genesis, the Big Bang, okay? I can't explain everything, obviously, because my brain does not function like a mathematician or a nuclear physicist or anything even close to that, um, but I'll give you kind of the basic uh, nutshell of it. So basically, what he did was, is he took the mass of the Earth, because they're able to measure it in the mass of the universe and he plugged them into Einstein's theory of general relativity. All right. So he took those calculations and, and relative to time, which is the time that they think the universe has been here is 13 billion years. All right. So he took these calculations and he plugged them into Einstein's theory of general uh, relativity. And he came up with something absolutely amazing okay this guy's an orthodox jew um he's not a christian but he but he came up with something awesome so the 13 billion years of the universe actually equates to how long on the earth when he plugged all this in 13 billion years of the universe actually when the numbers that he got after he put them into this uh, formula was six days so, again, Genesis told us that a long, long time ago. So, 16 or 13 billion years for the universe, and then he put all this into this equation, and he came up with the Earth being here, or being formed, in six days. So, we knew this. Genesis told us this a long time ago, but this um, Dr. Gerald Schroeder, he, he put the numbers to it. So, like I said, it's just, it's hilarious to me. He's a believer in God. I mean, he's an Orthodox Jew, but it's hilarious to me that people keep coming up with these things and they just keep proving God right. I love it. So, uh, these next verses, um, won't come as a surprise after, after, uh, reading that. So verse 13, who has directed the spirit of the Lord or, or has his counselor, or has his counselor has taught him or as his counselor has taught him sorry um so we'll go down through 18 here i'll read that again since i jacked it up who has directed the spirit of the lord or as his counselor has taught has taught him with whom did he take counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice obviously nobody because god formed all of this who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket. So that's probably where that saying comes from, a drop in a bucket. Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales. So I'll stop right there for a sec. So um, when they used to weigh things in those times, in biblical times, they would use scales and they would blow the dust off of stuff. 
um, so that they would make you think that you you weren't paying for the dust. But a lot of these people weren't being honest with their scales, and they used a certain um, weight um, to buy things, and then they used a heavier weight, which was all supposed to be one pound, um, but they used a heavier weight to sell things. So, um, and God calls them out on that. But anywho, that's what they're talking. That's kind of what it's referencing here is um, counted as small as the dust on the scales. All right. So look, he lifts up the aisles as look, he lifts up the aisles or coast coastlands as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beast sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. He's God. He's vast. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare to him? So we can compare nothing to him because he is the Almighty. He, nothing compares to God. All right, verse 19. The workman molds an image, the goldsmith overspreads it with gold, and the silversmith casts silver chains. Who is too impoverished for such a contribution? Chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. So if you weren't wealthy enough to make a gold idol or image to worship, then you went and got a tree and started carving on it. So that's what this is talking about here, idols. Okay, verse 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you, been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and, the, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Okay, so there again, um, we know that the earth is round, but the whole time the Bible has said the earth is round, even when people, scientists, you know, years and years ago thought the earth was flat, it is not. The Bible clearly said it is a circle, it's a sphere, okay? So we have to remember what time period we're in here, and Isaiah says it, he is, he it is he who sits above the circle of the earth. So uh, right there, it's not flat. So that's all people had to do was to look at that and they would know. They would just have to believe, right? Okay, and then Job actually says that he hanged the earth on nothing. <clears throat> so, and they scoffed at him because he said that, that he hung, that the, that God hung the earth on nothing. That's in uh, Job 26, 7. So, and then again, here we have, he stretches out the heavens like a curtain and he spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. And we, we've covered this in a previous Bible study. So he stretches out the heavens and we know in the book of Revelation, they are rolled back up like a scroll, a scroll. So in the end. All right. <clears throat> Verse 23. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted, scarcely shall they be sown, scarcely scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth, when he will also blow on them, and they will wither, and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. I wish that would happen soon. Soon enough, we got a lot of uh, evil people here. So, um, the princes of the earth, he makes useless, okay? Um, but these people think they are invincible. And they will be judged, and he will blow them away. Take them away in a whirlwind and make them like stubble. All right. Okay, verse 25. <clears throat> to whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. And I love that. I love, love, love that. That's in Psalms 147. So he brings out the host. He brings out the host by number and he calls them all by name. How awesome is that? I mean, you think about <clears throat> the host, the stars in heaven. You look up at the stars and he knows them all by name. They're vast. and it's the, and they speculate that just in our galaxy, 
there is 100,000 million stars just in our galaxy. <clears throat> so he's talking about all the host of heaven and he calls them all by name. And these aren't, if you've looked at, ever looked at some of the stars and he's got names for them, they're, they're not easy. It's not, they're, they're not like Fred. They're, 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 uh, in particular names, they've got some, some weird spellings. So what a memory, but he's God. So Psalm 147, four is actually, um, where you can find that too. So <clears throat> not one is missing. It says not one is missing. He calls them all by name, which is incredible to me. I love that. Okay. Verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my just claim is passed over by my God. You cannot hide from God. No one can hide from God and he knows all. Okay. He's, he's omnipresent. He's infinite. The beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, he knows all. You cannot hide from him. So I know some people think they do, but he's just, he's just touching on that here. So I will, I will touch on that. Um, he says, why do you say, O Jacob and speak, O Israel? So He's speaking of the whole house here, but what he's talking, when God changes a name in the Bible, it usually stands. It's just that way. Like Abram became Abraham, Sarai became Sarah. Um, but there's a few ex exceptions and Jacob is one of those. So God changed Jacob's name to Israel. But when Jacob is in the flesh, he calls him Jacob in the text. And you can usually tell by the text and the and what's going on in it, which one he's talking about, but he'll call him Jacob when he's in the flesh, when he's carnal, okay? Um, but when he's acting better, like he's got some sense, he's got a little class, he calls him Israel, all right? And sometimes you just have to judge because sometimes he'll refer to the whole house as Israel. But here he is referring to the whole house, but he's saying, oh, Jacob, Oh, Israel. So he's, he's speaking, speaking to the house as a whole. Cause remember they were split. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, um, I'm going to check my notes here and it's okay. I have that. He was referring to the whole house. All right. We'll finish this up. So, um, verse 28, have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So I'm sure you've heard that before. Um, that's a really popular, um, verse. So, um, what that is talking about is through Christ, we can do all things. And I'm sure you've heard that before too. So, um, it's talking about the endurance of walking in a Christian life. So he's talking about, they shall walk and not faint. So the endurance of walking in the Christian faith, and that is not an easy thing to do. God doesn't call people um, that are weak to walk with him and to do his duties. He calls people who he can use, who are open to him being, to being used. So when you know that your strength is nothing, when you know that you can do nothing without him, those are the people that he wants to use, but they are made strong through him. So they may look strong on the outside, um, but very weak in a sense. Um, but when you have God, this is what that's saying. So when you have God, you're never weak. Uh, the young men shall utterly fall, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They, sh they shall walk and not faint. So people that, that know that they are weak when it comes to God, that they can't do things um, all by their own might. Um, those are the people that God chooses to use. And so to be a Christian, 
it takes a lot of endurance um, to walk in faith and in this life. Um, but you have to fight the good fight and you have to keep going. So, um, and not by your strength, not by your own strength, by any means, because you'll never make it, but by his. So, okay. That, um, sums up chapter 40. I was going to kind of combine them, but I thought I'd do chapter 40 by itself. So I'll see you for chapter 41.